It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. If you have a loved one who is struggling with alcohol or other drugs, you may have feelings of frustration, anger, fear, or sadness. You may also feel powerless and unsure of how to offer help or support. According to today's guest, Dr. Jeffrey Foote, you don't have to try a tough approach or wait for your loved one to hit rock bottom before taking action. He contends that you can be a force for positive change. Dr. Foote joins us to offer practical advice to help you navigate substance use or other compulsive behaviors without creating conflict. Dr. Foote is co-author of the book, Beyond Addiction, and the Beyond Addiction Workbook for Family and Friends. Welcome, Dr. Foote. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, Doctor, it's been reported that one in four families in the United States are impacted by substance abuse. Why do you believe we are seeing this type of addiction rate? Well, it's not that's not a new rate, so that's really kind of the steady state that we've always had. Um, certainly, we're in the middle of a really terrible um, uh, overdose epidemic <clears throat> related to opiates and related to fentanyl specifically. But um, I, I guess I've been in this field long enough to have seen a variety of really terrible uh, moments in time. Back in the 80s, there was the um, uh, a window of time when, when crack was a big thing and uh, was creating a lot of havoc. And so we seem to have these different waves. Right now, this is a particularly terrible one of, um, of a lot of loss of life related to um, opiates. So, you know, when you, when you step back and look at the numbers um, and that rate of one in four families is affected, I think it's probably even almost a, a bit higher than that um, because um, if you just ask the question, how many people um, have alcohol use disorder in this country, you're talking about 20 million plus people. Um, and, you know, if an average family um, uh, is, you know, three, four people getting affected by that, um, then you're talking about 80 million people um, just for alcohol issues alone. So, um, it's an ongoing issue, and it's been with us for a long time. Well, you just said that this has been a problem that we've had for a long time. Has the pandemic made it worse? Did we have these types of numbers pre-COVID? It, it definitely made it worse. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the opiate overdose rate was going up um, astronomically since the uh, early teens, 2012, 2013, 2014, started to really escalate. Um, but certainly COVID has made that worse. COVID has made use of almost every substance worse, including alcohol. You mentioned that it seems to come in waves. Is there something that you're able to pinpoint going on within society that leads to these waves? No, I mean, there's always speculation in the studies on what causes these kind of things. Um, but, you know, if you look at that, the supply is always an issue. Um, the degree of uh, treatment that's available is an issue. The public education uh, is has an impact on these types of things. Um, you know, for right now, there's a there's a problem with supply, um, which is a a supply of opiates called fentanyl um, are causing a, a huge problem and a huge number of deaths. Um, but that's different than the emergence of crack, for instance, which was a new form of cocaine. Um, so it really sort of depends on the era and the substance. Um, and what we have tried to really focus on is just. How do we help people? Um, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and I spent my career doing work with the client who is struggling specifically with substances, the person who's got that issue. Um, but over the last 10 years, have really we really branched out and started to um, do some work with our foundation for families very specifically um, as a group of people who are also really neglected in this whole in this whole picture. Um, there's there's treatment providers, there's the people struggling with the substances. Uh, and then the kind of the last people who get any attention typically are families um, and, and what we've known about that for a long time, but, but the treatment system has not really acted on is 
boy, there's a lot of power in that in that family unit. And there's a huge amount of motivation, a huge amount of dedication and love. And if we could give families some tools that actually are effective um, instead of traditionally some tools that aren't aren't so awesome and aren't so effective, uh, we might really be able to make some headway. So that's what we have shifted our focus to as well. Obviously, education is important. And you just mentioned fentanyl. So for some of our listeners who may not be familiar with what is going on, can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I remember recently I was speaking with um, an addiction recovery specialist who told me when we were younger, if someone smoked mm-hmm. pot or something like that, you had the luxury of making a mistake. But with fentanyl, mm-hmm. he said, it only takes one time to kill you. Is that accurate? And, and can you tell our parents a little bit about it? Sure. Um, and, and the scary thing about fentanyl. So in, in, again, in, in the world of substance use, um, um, we're, also, <clears throat> we're also old enough to remember that there's always scary messages around substance use. Um, so, you know, going, going back, you know, 80 years, the, the messaging around any kind of substance, alcohol or marijuana, all these different things has always been kind of um, uh, amplified as a really terrible um, uh, type of, of experience that someone could have. And, you know, they'll, they'll be washed away um, in the grips of these things. Um, that often has not been the case, actually. It's not an accurate description of substances. Uh, we just happen to have a situation right now where fentanyl, which is a um, synthetic opiate, um, you know, so the non-synthetic opiates are things like heroin, um, and then we started to have a problem with uh, manufactured opiates for pain. Oxycontin has caused lots of problems and um, was widely distributed around the country and marketed heavily, which now pharmaceutical companies are you know, paying hundreds of millions of dollars to try to get off the hook for that kind of stuff. But um, um, as a separate issue, um, a, sub- a synthetic opiate called fentanyl has been um, around now for a decade and um, is a highly potent form of an opiate. So opiates, um, if you take too much of an opiate or if you take in a highly, uh, very strong version of an opiate, um, you uh, can shut down your breathing mechanism is really what happens. Um, and that's why people are dying. Um, so fentanyl has bizarrely made its way into all sorts of things on the internet, including benzodiazepine pills like Xanax and stuff like that. It's in there or it can be put into other substances. So um um, we're finding it in cocaine samples with people who come in and get tested for cocaine use. They have fentanyl in their cocaine. So people are overdosing with having no idea that they're taking an opiate. Um, so that's the really scary part right now. Well, you know, we always try to tell parents or loved ones what to watch out for, the warning signs of addiction. But with this, you may not even have the opportunity to see those signs. Right. That's true, because um, it can be a one-time thing. And again, after lots of years of messaging about one time will kill you. Um, this substance actually can kill people. It is a scary thing. Um, and again, what we have tried to start to do is work with families. Um, so there's, there's recognizing signs of substance use, but then there's the longer term picture of how do I really help a loved one? Um, and how can I effectively have them start to think about doing something different, have them start to think about changes. Um, and you know, with most families, when these issues come up, it, they're scary. Uh, they make people upset. They make people feel anxious. Um, if I'm the person using a substance in a family, I know that people are going to be upset and scared and, and angry and so forth. So I'm typically you know, going to go underground and not talk about it or not tell the truth about it, that kind of thing. Um, so communication typically gets bad and suffers and people just don't know how to interact around these issues. Um, and, you know, it's the last thing you want is a a family member or a parent is you want to know how to help you want to know uh, what would be effective here um, and and how to help me how do I navigate this situation it's not something that you know we were ever trained to do uh, as a parent and so so that's what we've done that's what we've written this new book beyond addiction workbook um, is to is to really help explain this and give people some very practical tools to approach their family member if a parent or a loved one sees the signs within a family member, and that person is not willing to admit that he or she has a problem. How can this situation be approached in a non-judgmental manner so that there is effective communication? Yeah. Well, we, we have um, spent the, about the last 10 years developing a whole approach uh, called the invitation to change. And the, and the words in that matter, it is an invitation um, that is being stressed 
um, to uh, a loved one to consider change. Uh, and sometimes that way of thinking about it can can feel um, challenging to a family member, to a, to a parent, for instance, um, because they would rather just have change happen. Um, so most of us as family members are more likely to go into the demand change mode uh, as opposed to inviting change. And so in this approach, the invitation to change, there are, uh, there are sort of three main areas to think about as a, as a helper. And it's what we would consider a helping model. How can I be a more effective helper? And, th- and that could be as a parent, as a sibling, as a friend, uh, as a therapist. So it's not really just limited to families, um, but it's a way to know how to help. Uh, and we start with trying to help people um, help with understanding. So how can I understand the other person? Um, and I'll, I can talk about that in a minute. Then we also talk about helping with awareness. How do I stay aware of myself in this process? And then helping with action. What are the tools specifically, um, reinforcement communication tools that I can use? But we start with the whole helping with understanding. This is kind of the foundation of how to be an effective helper. Um, if I, if what we have found over and over again is if I can't really put myself in the other person's shoes just even a little bit, doesn't mean I have to. I'm, I'm not agreeing. I'm not, you know, um, blessing what they're doing. I'm just trying to get myself to understand what might be happening here over in their side of the street. Um, it, if I can do that, if I can start to think through, this is my kid. I know how anxious they are. I know when they smoke pot. It really helps them socialize. It really helps them um, uh, not feel so anxious all the time. Otherwise, they may even actually go out of the house. Um, those types of understandings really start to shift our whole approach to our loved one. Um, because then instead of feeling like an assault on us or an insult or a betrayal, um, it starts to feel like, okay, I don't like this, but I get it. I can understand, you know, you have – my husband has chronic pain and, you know, from a, an injury to his back. Um, my wife is grieving the, the loss of her mother and has been in a terrible place with this for the last year and has been drinking too much. Like these, are, these are the reasons that people use substances, not because they're evil. They use them because it makes sense to them in some way, in, in very straightforward ways, not, not hard to understand ways. Um, and if we can help a family member start there can you look across the table and get yourself in that person's head a little bit and understand why this might be happening it just changes the whole interaction it makes it more compassionate it makes me feel less betrayed it makes me feel like helping more Um, and then i can move into um, other tools and learn how to communicate in, in new ways that are really helpful but if i'm just angry and upset and feeling betrayed all the time because uh, I don't understand this at all, I'm, I'm going to have a much harder time being a, an effective helper. When you take this approach as a loved one, do you find that the person who is addicted becomes more receptive? Is this a way in to help the person? It is. And, you know, it, it, the, it's very easy to have an interaction with somebody. You know, as I was mentioned before, you know, the, your loved one um, – knows they're doing something that you probably don't approve of or that, you know, you would be upset about. Um, and so it's very easy to have an interaction with that person that makes them go underground or makes them feel defensive or makes them feel aggressive towards me. Um, like that's, that's the usual, you know? So the real question is how do I, how do I approach this in a way that's going to help them be less defensive help them put some of their guard down, help them feel like, okay, we could have a talk about this. I don't have to just shut you out totally because that's what you want. I, I want to be able to talk to you. I want you to be able to maybe hear some ideas. I want to be able to understand what's going on with you. Um, and that stuff is, that communication is very easy to shut off. Um, so yes, starting with a, from a place of understanding them, again, not the same as agreeing uh, um, um, or blessing it, but understanding really changes what's going on. And the second part of this then is, is of this helping idea is helping with self-awareness. So that's the part where we include ourselves in this change process. So I want to help my son or daughter or husband or whoever it is. Um, can I stay aware of myself in this process? So I'm, I've spent a little time trying to understand what's going on with you. Um, now can I also be paying attention to me and knowing that 
I'm really tense or I'm really upset or I'm pretty exhausted um, and I'm in a lot of pain. Um, and can I start to bring that into the picture so that I'm not just left out of this all the time and feeling like I've, I've completely run out of gas or um, I've got nothing left in me to help anymore. Um, so not forgetting ourselves in this equation matters a lot um, in sustaining these kind of this helping role. You know, people really exhaust themselves trying to help loved ones. Um, and then they're just in the worst place. They're angrier, they're more, more fatigued, uh, you know, not thinking straight um, and acting in ways that they don't want to be acting as a person either. So yeah. the awareness part is helping them become aware of themselves, including as a family member, including your own values. How do you want to show up to this? How do you want to be as a parent? Um, even, even though you're worried and upset, how do you want things to be going with your child and you um, or your husband and you? Um, and being able to access that, that part of you and say, I, I could shout and I could scream and slam the doors and kick them out, but that's not actually who I am as a person. That doesn't feel right to me. That isn't, it's not what I want with my loved one here. So how can I pay attention to myself and understand what it is I do want and how, how I do want to show up to this? Well, you made a great point also, Doctor, because I think a lot of times people come from that place of shouting and demands and, you know, the ultimatums because they think that if they approach it in any other way, they're enabling and they're condoning the behavior. Mm -hmm. So that was a great mm -hmm. point that you made because I think people try to navigate that balance, enabling and loving kindness. And, and no doubt, you know, the, the, the shouting and the, and the yelling and stuff like that is coming from, I mean, they want to help still, um, but they're frustrated or the end of their rope kind of a thing. And, and that's where we, we can all get to that place. You know, it's, it's totally understandable. Um, and all we're saying in this in this invitation to change approach is slow down, check in with yourself, know that this is hard, let's acknowledge that this is painful. But if you're trying to help somebody you love, it's going to be painful. And we talk about that idea as trying to change our whole relationship to to pain, really, and to discomfort. Um, you know, we can get into the feeling of, you know, why can't they just go back to how they used to be and why can't our family just run the way it used to run and you know i didn't i didn't ask for this um and of course that's true we didn't ask for it um and it's not going to go back the way it was so can i can i do some work to accept the idea that this is actually where we are this is true um and it's going to be hard and it's going to be painful and the goal doesn't have to be to try to make all that pain go away to try to make us a, a quote happy family again um, the goal can be, how do we stay connected? How do I show up in ways that are so important to me? And how can I help them think about this? You know, shouting, back to the question about the shouting, yes, it's, it's less likely um, to be effective because you're just going to make the person get back against the wall and feel defensive. Mm -hmm. And then you've lost them. You had mentioned before that some people who get addicted are people who start off with a bad back, they have back pain or... They have other types of pain that escalates to an addiction. How much mm -hmm. of the addiction issue is tied to mental health issues? Is, is that what we should be addressing at the core? Well, I think, I think we should be addressing it all. You know, um, the, the, <clears throat> the whole idea, I mean, we, we can use the word addiction. Sometimes people use this, have the idea that it's a disease, that kind of a thing. Um, there's, there's not a lot of evidence for that. <laughs> truthfully, um, and um, that can be kind of a, a shocker to people, but really, if you step back and look at who's struggling with substances, it's a wide spectrum of people, um, from very mild issues to life-threatening issues across all sorts of substances, and the way I got into this problem is different than the next 10 people in line. I mean, it's, it, it's really not a, you know, if you think of a disease, you think of something that is Uniform. We can describe the symptoms and the signs of that and what organs it affects and that kind of stuff and what's the typical course. There's nothing like that in substance use issues. There's, a, there's millions upon millions of people who have problems with substance use and then they don't anymore. So like the idea that it's a lifelong disease, it's not actually true. Um, sometimes that's true and it's a lifelong struggle and sometimes it's not true. Um, and I got into it because of my back pain and you got into it because your dad and his dad had really terrible 
alcohol problems and it's genetic. It's a genetic loading for it in your family. And the next person got into it because they have terrible social anxiety, to your point about other mental health issues, or they have really bad depression. Um, and taking a, a bunch of stimulants is really helpful to them that, that lets them function. So there's multiple paths into these problems and multiple paths out. There isn't really one size fits all, uh, which is another one of the things we talk about in the Beyond Addiction Workbook. It's one size is not truly going to fit your loved one <clears throat> the same way it's going to fit your neighbor's loved one. Um, everyone is different. And um, family members are actually the experts in this. They know what's going on. Um, most family members could describe, they may, if you ask them why your kid or your husband using substances, you may get an angry response at first because they're just they're irresponsible, because they're a jerk, because, you know, whatever. Um, but if you slowed them down and said, okay, and why else? <laughs> you know, who are they what, that lead them to drink too much? Um, they would tell you. They would say, well, you know, he works really long hours and I, I've always thought he doesn't know how to express his feelings and he doesn't know how to blow off steam in any other way than what he learned in college. And so he goes out with his buddies and he drinks way too much and he blacks out. Okay. Good explanation. It's not an excuse. It's an actual explanation for that person. And that's different than the, their neighbor's husband who drinks too much. This is, this is an important part of, of how to think about this. Um, when we say <clears throat> that behaviors make sense, the substance using behaviors make sense. Again, I don't have to like it, but it does make sense. Um, and, and it's different. One size doesn't fit all. It's different for each person. Um, uh, and it's really critical to, if I'm going to be an effective helper, to actually understand this person, not some person that we're calling an addict or some other sort of pejorative word like that. Right. Labeling the person. Once you yeah. understand the situation where that person's coming from and you have an open line of communication what next what happens next yeah well having an open line of communication can take a while right. <laughs> so so me understanding is uh, helpful it'll slow me down it'll probably ultimately create some space here in our household for you the person who's struggling to feel safer to talk to me um, but that can take a while um, and, and in the meantime, as we were talking about, you know, I need to be aware of myself. I need to be aware of my own values. Um, I need to be able to start to develop some self-compassion in this whole process. Um, and when I have, if I can keep working on those aspects, understanding them, understanding myself, it creates much more of a fertile ground for things like communication skills training. Um, you know, um, one of the one of the most straightforward ones we talked about is is just simply listening to another person. Can you tell me what's going on? I, I'm not actually going to sit here and make suggestions and try to get you to go to treatment and tell you what's wrong and blah, blah, blah. I just actually just like to hear from you. Like That's a really unusual thing for lots of families when they're under a lot of pressure. The desire to, to say, okay, okay, thanks for telling me that. Now can we go to rehab is really strong. So can we learn to just listen? A lot of these skills come from something called motivational interviewing. And, and so this, this whole model, the invitation to change, has elements of different evidence-based approaches that we know are very effective. Motivational interviewing is one of them. It's a whole set of communication skills that are really helpful in lowering defenses. There are skills from something called CRAFT, Community Reinforcement and Family Training. How do you do positive reinforcement with somebody? How do you notice the things that are changing instead of only being able to pay attention to the negative stuff every time it happens because that's how we're tuned. You know, we're like waiting for the next shoe to drop and I'm waiting for you to have a relapse and I'm waiting for something bad to happen. That's understandable. But if we are missing any positives, it's not a very rewarding environment for our loved one. So if I as a family member, and this is the action questions you're asking about, if I as a family member can start to notice, I appreciated you getting home on time. You may have smelled like pot, I don't know, but I do appreciate that you got home on time. I appreciate you cleaning your room. Can we start to have some, some positive um, stuff in the mix here uh, to kind of ease the tension, to kind of make this be a place where I will notice change. I will notice success. I will notice positive things. And the number of people who are struggling with substances who say, yeah, my parents, my spouse, all they notice is the negative. I'm always getting lectured. I'm always messing up. It, it's a lot. That, that is what happens, you know. So can we help ourselves as helpers to notice some of the positive stuff? We know that positive reinforcement is one of the most powerful things we can do to facilitate change. It's just true. It's just as a principle of every research study ever done on change, it doesn't have to do with substances at all. If you want to help somebody change, positive reinforcement is your most powerful tool.
we're talking about addiction in this conversation, but what you're teaching us can be applied to foster any type of relationship. Absolutely. Foster relationships, foster connection and closeness, uh, foster greater positivity, and foster change. And again, as you just said, it doesn't have to be about substances. It's not a unique thing. Um, these are principles that are helpful um, for behavior change of any sort. You know, we all struggle with ambivalence about change. I'm asking my husband to stop drinking uh, or to change my kid to change their marijuana use um, while I struggle with exercise and eating. Okay. And there's some common principles in how to help people change that don't, don't have to do with the marijuana and the alcohol part. It have to do with how do we help open those doors for someone, you know? The book is the Beyond Addiction Workbook for Family and Friends, Evidence-Based Skills to Help a Loved One Make Positive Change. Doctor, if our listeners would like to get more information about you and your work, where can they go? Well, I think the, the book is available at um, newharbinger.com. Um, and our foundation um, has, has a lot of materials and resources for families. Um, is uh, cmcffc.org. That's the CMC Foundation for Change. So it's cmcffc.org. And you can go there and, and look at videos and get lots of materials there as well. Doctor, in about 30 seconds or less, what's the takeaway? What do you want to leave our listeners with? Well, one of the things we talk about here is, is this is a, um, a set of ideas that we also call a combination of science and kindness. Um, and for way too long in this country, certainly, I think we've had a, a much harsher approach, approach to substance issues and a much more confrontational approach. Uh, and confrontation doesn't work. That's the problem with it. Um, kindness, understanding, self-awareness, values-based approaches, um, and better communication. Those are all things that can be learned. They take practice. Um, but if you can spend some time practicing them, you're going to actually have a better shot at helping, um, helping invite some change in your family. Dr. Foote, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, cyacyl.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.